Okay, so this afternoon's session will be chaired by Rodolfo Russo, um, but I forgot, like, as we're running a little over time, I want to just thank Daniel for an excellent talk this morning. It was really very, very good and um, delightful to kick, good way to pick, cook off the conference. So over to you, Rodolfo. Okay, uh, then uh, without further ado, let's start uh, this uh, afternoon session, at least in Europe, with uh, Nia Esh Ashfordi. Uh, maybe Nia Esh, can you, can you put full screen and see? I think we are seeing your, your viewpoint. Oh. oh, okay. So let me see what I can do. Okay. Probably you have to choose the right, uh, okay. yeah, the right window to share. Mm. Okay, so yeah, let me see. Um, let me get rid of that and... Uh... If you hit play, I think it'll do the job. Yeah. Um, okay, so now let's see. Um, hmm. Hit play yeah, in the middle of the screen, at the top. Middle of the you screen at the top. After, yeah, after like a year and a half, I figured this thing out, but there's always something new. So is this Yeah, better? that's good. That's great. Yes. Okay. Good, good. Okay. Uh, very good. So uh, uh, I don't know whether I can uh, make any sign, but I think it's uh, the easiest way is I tell you like 10 minutes uh, to the hour, just to give you an idea of when, when the talk is finishing. So, so we are, I guess, doing questions in the middle of the talk. We're not doing separate time for... Uh, I mean, question. as you prefer. I mean, if you want to make it interactive, or if you prefer to have everything in the end, as you, yeah. you can. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I'm happy to be interrupted at any point, and I do have a lot of bonus slide and uh, well, extra slides. So if there are questions, uh, yeah, I, I, if if there are things that are not clear, just ask me about it, and I have additional chances are I have additional slides that could clarify things. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, please feel free to start. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for coming at either this, uh, this, well, for me, it's a very early hour. For some of you, it might be more reasonable. Um, it's uh, good to be here. Uh, it's, it's a shame we cannot be there in person and, and talk uh, casually, but uh, here we are. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, quantum black holes and or black hole microstructures. <laughs> So the title of my talk is, uh, so I kind of, I was thinking about this about a month ago or so, uh, called Black Holes Unscripted. And the reason for this is that basically we all have kind of uh, some picture of what you think black holes are. Um, astronomers do, black holes are such a popular topic. I mean, they're all over science fiction, for example. So everybody has some sort of a preconceived picture of what it is no matter who they are, a master physicist, a string theorist, you name it. Uh, but for most of it, there is very little evidence. For some, there is evidence, but a lot of the what we think about what happens inside a black hole or at the cross the horizon, we all have a story without much evidence. So, uh, and what I'm going to try to do is that how we could actually write this story with as much evidence as we can get, uh, and then let go of the rest. Okay. So, of course, this is uh, these are introductions that we are all I mean, we're not going to talk about it. We have Nobel Prizes, we have nice pictures, we have gravitational waves, um, uh, we have more Nobel Prizes, as, as you know, just last year. Um, so, so black holes are are the are it? They are, they are the thing to work on these days. <clears throat> uh, and then there is a script for how they came to be and what they look like. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the script as introduction, and it, this is something you all know, but I want to emphasize the things that are, uh, are part of the story and the things that are uh, real are, are observationally confirmed. So that's why um, basically I want to talk about the script or the story. Or, uh, and then I'm going to talk about what unscripting it mean. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about the observations. Okay, so let's uh, get us started. So you're familiar with um, uh, how event horizons and relativity come about. There's a global structure in the space time and that leads to formation of singularities and event horizons that, uh, well, if you are inside, you're unlucky enough to be inside the event horizon, then you have no uh, possible fate but to end up on a singularity. Um, but in classical GR, we all teach and learn uh, at kindergarten that there is no drama at the horizon. So 
uh, all good people who are well educated in general relativity learn that nothing special happens at the horizon. And based on this, and I'm I'm really skipping uh, the, the entire 50 years of history, and uh, so there is a story of black hole and the story of black hole evaporation. Uh, and there has been a lot of excitement about this. There will be talks about this uh, throughout the week, not today, but in the rest of the days, um, about how black hole evaporation should work. And so basically all based on a semi-classical evaporation description, which is an assumption. And uh, the great excitement of the past couple of years, uh, one way to kind of summarize it or trivialize it is that we have some semi-classical rules uh, that appear to be consistent with the semi-classical story of, a, in particular, the page care, which is how the entropy of the black hole increases and then decreases. So we now have a semi-classical way of calculating the entropy that is consistent with the semi-classical story. What is missing and uh, somewhat disappointing, or at least uh, needs uh, leaves you wanting for more, is I mean, even if you have a great a story. Which, uh, which is a physical about the description of something physical, is it, uh, it doesn't have any testable predictions. And based on this story, what do we learn about quantum gravity or quantum black holes? So that's kind of the, um, the missing part where the, where the story doesn't cover. And you would like, as satisfying as a story might be, um, if it doesn't give you testable predictions and it doesn't teach, teach you something deeper about quantum gravity, uh, it's not quite clear what you've achieved uh, in terms of a physical, uh, physical science. Okay, so that's kind of my, uh, my I, I guess, introduction or a spiel about why we wanna have something a bit more physical than this story of black hole evaporation. Okay, so, so now let's, talk about what, uh, what's wrong with the story. And in fact, if, if you are here, uh, chances are that you are on board with the fact that there's something wrong with that story. And uh, here is my, my summary, which is, I think, a slightly different from uh, Daniel's summary from the uh, previous talk, uh, because we have different trajectories of how we, we arrived at this, uh, well, what, what's wrong with the story. So the first one is actually the same as, is, uh, as you've heard, this information paradox. Uh, and in fact, it's the most famous one. The unitary black hole evaporation is not consistent with local physics plus a smooth horizon. Uh, and this was, of course, first uh, pointed out by Hawking and it became, uh, it, it was elaborated over time. Um, Partly by Samir Masur, uh, who has been one of the uh, champions of the fuzzball paradigm, and we're going to hear from him soon. It's, I don't know if Samir, Samir is, is he here or not yet? I, uh, maybe it's still too yeah, early. Some other commitment, but he said he'd join us as soon as he could. Right. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, he's, he's inspired a lot of us to work on this program uh, from, from very different fields. Um, so, uh, so, but also, I mean, another uh, another champion of this story is uh, is Amps, who uh, kind of popularized and revived the information paradox. So this is Almeri Merrill Polchinski or late uh, Joe Polchinski uh, and um, Sally. So they uh, revived this the story of um, uh, so this the story of. Um, uh, firewall of what's what's become known as a firewall, which is uh, really an inconsistency in the standard story of black hole evaporation. So there's something wrong with the standard story. Uh, although AMPS actually doesn't tell you how to solve it uh, really in a physical way, uh, what Samir had done is come up with, a, uh, with an alternative story, an alternative physical mechanism, which, which is quantum tunneling. And this is in fact, uh, the thing that makes the most physical sense to me and I mean, I think this is the thing that needs to be taught in kindergarten alongside the standard story of black hole evaporation or black holes. So, and that has to do with quantum tunneling. I mean, uh, semi-classical physics is nice, but it's really very close to classical physics and where uh, quantum mechanics really shines and uh, makes a difference is where non-perturbative effects happen. In particular, the non-perturbative effect that, uh, uh, 
is important for well, a lot of processes in nature, uh, for example, why the sun shines, it, it's quantum tunneling. But in particular for black holes, what you could show is uh, uh, quantum tunneling, which is an exponentially uh, suppre suppressed process, is in fact not very small for black holes because black holes have huge entropy. Uh, and the exponentially suppressed number, which is, uh, happens to be e to the minus classical action roughly, uh, is exactly as, uh, balanced with the exponential of the entropy and the product of them is an order of one number. So that means that this is my classical story that we've been in, built an entire 50 years uh, or, or so of uh, black hole evaporation story on is based on a false premise, which is some of classicality. Uh, which in ex exactly ignores these exponentially suppressed uh, factors. So if you do include them, uh, then um, as soon as you form a horizon uh, or something that looks like a classical horizon, then perturbation theory breaks down, and then you have to work with quantum gravity states. Okay. Uh, I have a, I mean, third personal motivation for this, which is how I got from cosmology uh, to this story, and that has to do with. Um, with the explaining a scale of dark energy. Uh, and I think it's an interesting uh, side of story that I'm not gonna talk about unless someone asks me about it. Um, and it, there's an interesting coincidence that if you take a stellar mass black holes and replace the, assume that they are in equilibrium with dark energy, it gets rid of their horizon and it actually naturally sets the scale of dark energy to the observed value. Uh, so, uh, I had a paper on this uh, a while ago with my former student Chandler Prescott Weinstein and uh, with, uh, well, to my recent master's student who just finished Samantha Hergat. So that's an interesting uh, side of story which kind of confirms the, uh, that there might be something wrong with the standard story of horizon sitting there and no drama happening at the horizon, uh, but um, it's more speculative than, than the others. But I guess at some level, all of these are speculative. Okay, so this slide might be a bit redundant, as I said, because uh, if you are here, chances are that you, you are already a skeptical of the standard uh, story and you're already sold on the fuzzball pro program. And if you are, then that's great, then we are all on the same page. Okay, so uh, let's go. So what happens if you are, um, if you are a skeptic about the, no drama. If you think horizon is not there or horizon is modified. So this was, of course, uh, pointed out uh, shortly after gravitational waves were detected that if you, uh, if you put, if you replace horizon by some quantum structure, uh, so there were papers by uh, Vitor Cardoso, Paolo Pani, and uh, I think uh, Franzin, uh, just a month after the LIGO paper, LIGO results were released. This is a slightly later paper. Uh, by Cardoso, uh, Harper, Machido, Palenzuola, and Paolo uh, Pani, who's going to talk just after my, uh, after this talk. And what they pointed out, which is something that I guess we could have known about uh, many, many decades ago, but uh, somehow we didn't talk about it until gravitational waves were detected, was you expect these delayed echoes that we heard about as well, uh, that are really a smoking gun for uh, any modification of the horizon. And the reason for that is that as we all learn again in kindergarten, that it takes infinite time to fall into the horizon as seen uh, by the observer at infinity. Um, so observer that sees uh, somebody or something falling to the horizon, it just freezes and never actually crosses it because of the infinite redshift effect. But if the horizon is not there, I would replace it with something very close to the horizon, uh, that time is not exactly infinite, uh, but it's logarithmically long. And after that, then something non-trivial or non-perturbative should happen. In particular, the picture could be that uh, the, generically, if you replace horizon with something uh, like a membrane or a fuzzball or a firewall, then there will be some partial reflection from it. It would be different from what it would be in a standard GR or vacuum. Uh, and then as a result of that and the structure of general relativity, there would be waves that are stuck between the angular momentum barrier and the, the fuzzball uh, or the quantum structure. And this does lead to echoes. And the time scale for echoes is logarithmically long, as you see, there's a log here, right? And that has to do with the fact that uh, in the 
classical limits, it takes infinite time actually for the echoes to, to be reflected. But uh, for any finite uh, UV scale, this log is finite. Uh, and in fact, logs, as we know, can never get really very big. Um, so, I mean, for a, uh, for a stellar black hole, this is a border of 100, this log, right? This is a border of 100. So uh, the time scale now, you could calculate it for the first black hole that was uh, black hole merger that was detected. Um, so it's at GW 150914. You could see the waveform down there. You could see these oscillations here is about the fraction, like a percent of uh, 10 millisecond or so, uh, or 1% of a, a second, these oscillations. Uh, and what you don't usually see in these pictures is a uh, time scale of order of uh, 0.3 second. But in fact, if you plug in the numbers uh, for this black hole and assume Planck scale physics near the horizon, within 0.3 second, uh, an echo should be expected. Uh, and then it could be repeating basically because the, you could go back and forth, uh, back, back and forth basically. So every 0.3 second or so, you expect a new echo. Uh, to show up, although there would be weekend depending on your model. Okay, so that's the story behind the echoes. That if you if you don't think you know what's happening at the horizon, but imagine some agnostic point of view uh, that there's some quantum structure that sits there, uh, and it has generically like anything in nature. If something gets to it, there would be some finite reflection. Uh, then you do expect echoes, and uh, you could predict the time scale of the echoes uh, rather precisely because it only has logarithmic dependence on UV physics. Okay, any questions so far? So this is the premise of uh, what I'm going to mostly talk about for the rest of uh, for the, for the rest of the hour. Um, uh, trying to basically understand more precisely what these echoes would look like from quantum mechanical perspective and then from observational perspective. Okay, and I think uh, Paolo will also be work, uh, talking uh, along the similar directions, uh, but we have kind of we have different perspectives on this. And in um, case you're sorry, wondering, I hey, go sorry. ahead. Can I interrupt? Yes. Uh, one question about the quantum tunnel that you mentioned before. Yes. Um, so these two exponentials give an order unity quantity when the two arguments are exactly the same. Otherwise, being exponential, it can be exponentially yeah. separate, yeah. right? Yes. So does this mean that really the entropy and the uh, classical action should precisely match? Uh, the, and they, they do. Work? They, they do. And this is one of the interesting things about classical relativity that uh, uh, Euclidean action for uh, GR solutions is the same as the entropy, is the same as the surface area. So they do exactly match. You can also make a direct calculation, Paolo. So we actually, uh, with Daniel and Andrea and uh, Bert, we calculated the tunneling exactly in microstate geometries. And there you can find the coefficient on the nose. So if you assume there are E to this microstate geometries, you can compute the tunneling by just, you know, look, looking at the potential and, you know, doing the, doing the WTB integral. So, you know, with all the factors of two taken into account, and there we can also see, so, you know, in Samir's argument, the argument is okay, the action is over the e to the s and, you know, tunneling is over e to the minus s, but there's no calculation directly. But for microstate geometries uh, in the in the, in, in the the m to m to m to duality frame, you can actually do the honest to goodness, to goodness calculation using using the DNF quiver action. And, you know, there's a nice calculation and it comes exactly on the nose to the e to the minus s with a coefficient in front of there, which is actually reasonably big. So the tunneling happens a tiny bit before the horizon, but okay, that's a... Mm -hmm. That's a side calculation. So the one example where you can do the calculation with the equal signs, it works. So if that's any mm -hmm. of any encouragement. Thanks, Yusuf. That's very good. Yeah, indeed. Um, it, it, it's good that uh, I'm often when I'm giving talk, I'm the only one who's who's uh, who's the proponent of this uh, and have to defend the idea. It's great to have other people in the room who are defending this. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <clears throat> good. So uh, so that's. Uh, Th that's uh, why we think the horizons are there, as, as we just heard, and then the, the, the echoes is kind of one of the byproducts or smoking guns. Okay, so now, of course, this idea of echoes is due to Cardoso and collaborators, uh, including pa Paolo, who's here. Um, and but the next question is that okay, so what do we expect the echoes to be? I mean, how how big, what shape, basically, what are we what are we talking about here? 
So I have been considerable work on this, uh, but really it's a very hard problem because we don't really know what these fuzzballs, I mean, as we heard in the last talk, uh, it's, uh, this is a very, very hard problem, uh, the quantum structure and how it interacts with light or gravitational waves. Um, so it would be good to have some generic arguments. And um, here's one that we came up with, and it was basically came out of nowhere. It was very surprising. Um, in fact, what we were doing is, uh, so this was a work with uh, Naritaka Oshita, who was a postdoc at Perimeter, and now is, uh, he's at um, Riken in, in Japan. And then my former PhD student, uh, Ching Wen Wang. Uh, so uh, what Naritaka found out was that he was doing this modified dispersion relation calculation uh, near the black hole horizon, imagining that at high energies, like in Hojava Lipschitz, for example, um, dispersion relation changes. It's not Lorentzian dispersion relation. And he was finding that no matter what he did, uh, if you add some dissipation term, then you get the same reflectivity. Of course, in a standard GR, there is no reflectivity of the horizon. But if you add a small uh, dissipation, um, no matter I mean how big it is, independent of how big it is, um, you always get some reflectivity. And reflectivity, in fact, is um, independent of the amount of dissipation that you add. Uh, it's just the dissipation becomes important, a small, a closer or farther from the horizon. But at the end of the day, it gives you the same, same reflectivity. And it's given by Boltzmann factor, right? Which we all learn again in uh, in, uh, in a stat a statistical mechanics uh, in kindergarten, obviously, or even pre-kindergarten. Um, and so we, so that was that was surprising. And in fact, we we kind of came up with an argument based on flu fluctuation dissipation theorem that if you think there is uh, there is there's a thermal thermal bath of Hawking uh, Hawking photons, then then you could use fluctuation dissipation theorem and show that. Basically, um, there should be a reflectivity that just depends on the temperature of the thermal bath. And then we found two other arguments that were independent and gave exactly the same thing. Uh, we, we came up with an argument based on thermodynamic detail bands that I'm going to uh, mention uh, uh, shortly. And then another one based on CP symmetry, if you assume the state of the black hole has a CP, CP symmetry. And they all give the same the same result, independent of I mean the microphysics. You get the both. Question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now uh, for um, extremal BPS uh, black holes or supersymmetric microstates, uh, uh, this doesn't apply at, at least uh, naively. If the temperature is zero, you. We can have uh, echoes uh, in the in that case. Right, right. No, I mean, I think that, that certainly that you could have echoes, but those are, I think, purely quantum uh, objects. And here we're talking about... Um, no, no. Yeah. No. They're not purely quantum objects. Okay, go ahead. No, I don't, I, I, I don't agree, but... Uh, right. Okay, maybe so the, couple, uh, because of the extremality property, but... Uh, no, no, okay, so let me, let me elaborate this. Stuff. Now, here we are talking about... Uh, basically geometries that have horizons, right? So if you don't have a horizon, obviously you can have echoes, right? Because you just have, you, have, you could have a star and send things in and come, they come out. Okay. So, uh, and for a stars, I mean, I don't think it's, it's a non-trivial statement that there will be echoes. There, there will always be echoes if there are no horizons. And I think those are what you're talking, you're talking about horizonless geometries. Yeah, but I mean, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Cool. That's right. So, so here, what I'm talking, and this is a generic statement for if you do have a horizon which has a temperature, um, so that then I mean, if you have a horizon which has zero temperature, then of course this tells you that there are no echoes. In fact, what it happens is it takes infinite time to reach uh, reach the horizon in classical physics. Um, so. I think if you get rid of the horizon, you can certainly get echoes. Uh, I don't think those are very relevant for uh, for for classical for for four dimensional observables because we don't we don't make those things uh, in 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 nature uh, at least not that we can observe today. But now I agree that there could be uh, there could be exceptions. So here we're talking about the black holes that have Rindler geometry near their horizons. And uh, if if that regime doesn't exist, then none of these apply. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, and in fact, one thing that we showed is that echoes are a stimulated Hawking radiation. So I, I'm going to uh, 
talk a little bit more about that in the, in, the, uh, in the next slide. But I, I noticed that uh, Daniel talked about this eta over s, uh, the, the, entro the viscosity over entropy relationship that comes from GR and it's one over four pi. And uh, one thing that we show is that uh, basically this uh, Boltzmann reflectivity is equivalent to modifying this relationship at low frequency. So at high frequencies, in fact, that's correct. But as you're, you're going to frequencies that are smaller or comparable to Hawking radiation, uh, your, your viscosity, in fact, becomes much smaller uh, according to this law. So that's an interesting modification of this, uh, this correspondence between uh, the, the fluid properties or the membrane paradigm properties and, uh, and the 4D bulk properties. Now, as to where the echoes come from and a simulation of Hawking radiation, basically the picture is that uh, if you have a black hole or a fuzzball, or basically you have a sub-excited quantum state in vacuum, we know that in this picture, a, a spontaneous emission um, of photons or gravitons is the same as the Hawking radiation. Basically, the system de-excites, goes to lower and lower energy states through emitting uh, Hawking radiation. But you could also imagine the same that you could do with an atom uh, when you say shine lasers. Uh, you could excite uh, or, or you could stimulate the emission by embedding your system in some bath of photons of the right frequency then uh, this emission could be uh, stimulated at, and it, you have much higher, higher rate of emission, basically. So if you have some in incident radiation, uh, if, and this is your atom here sitting in the middle, then you're gonna have a stimulated emission that's gonna be much higher basically by the occupation number compared to the spontaneous emission. And in fact, this Boltzmann reflectivity is just saying that uh, if you embed your black hole in some background radiation, then that background radiation is gonna stimulate the Hawking radiation. And uh, that's, that's gonna look like some reflectivity or echoes, basically you're, you're, you're throwing some radiation at your black hole, that's gonna stimulate Hawking radiation. And then, when, uh, and then basically you get more Hawking radiation coming out, which would look like some reflected light or reflected gravitons. But uh, if, you, if you think this is Hawking radiation, then it, uh, it gives you, Basically, it should follow this law reflectivity of this is given by the Boltzmann factor. Okay, so um, anyway, so these are all based on thermodynamic interpretations, and I mean, I think obviously, if you have systems that are not uh, thermal, or you're not, you don't have, you don't have uh, a thermal sampling sampling of the Hilbert space, then uh, say for individual microstates, this may not apply. But for a generic microstate, if you want to use thermodynamic arguments, uh, which have some assumptions, then these arguments should go through. So another interesting um, uh, thing I mentioned that came out is the CP symmetry. Uh, so CP symmetry is basically imagining if you have this two-sided black hole. Um, so this is, the, this is a Penrose diagram that you're kind of familiar with. Usually, uh, it should go. Um, Sorry, um, I think something happened. Um, right. So the Penrose diagram that you're familiar with would look um, uh, for a two sided black hole would look like this, right? So this is kind of the perspective of this. Um, so this is in ADS space, you could do it in flat earth space as well. But so you, you could impose CP symmetry in this space time. This is also known as RP3 geons where you just take, there are a line in the middle, like this line, and imagine that there's a reflection symmetry on the two sides, right? So that you identify the left-hand side with the right-hand side. And this is something that uh, people have written about for, uh, I mean, for, for, a, few, for a few years, uh, for many years. And, um, and most recently, in fact, it's interesting, I think Jeff is gonna talk about this uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, he's claiming that if you're, uh, in, in fact, if you don't want to have extensive violations of quantum information uh, additivity conjectures, right? If you don't want that, then you um, you want to modify things near the horizon. And one possibility is basically this is the two quotient of the two-sided black hole, where you identify left and right. And what we showed is that, in fact, if you do this, you exactly get Boltzmann reflectivity because what it does this um, this identification. Uh, maps your left moving and right moving modes to each other. So 
you have left moving modes and right moving modes in this space time. But the identification maps one to the other. And in fact, if you do this and then translate to linear coordinate, you, you exactly get the Boltzmann reflectivity that you had here. So th those two are identical statements. Okay. Uh, so I, hopefully we're going to talk about his, uh, Jeff's arguments about this tomorrow, but uh, I just wanted to point it out that these are, if you if you believe this, this, this CP symmetry or this Z2 quotient of two-sided black hole, that's the same as saying that there's Boltzmann reflectivity because that maps, uh, that identifies left moving with right moving modes. modes. Any questions? Actually, I have another question about related sure. to your reflectivity. So sure. the, um, the time scale, uh, or if you want, uh, K, uh, the H bar over KT uh, temperature of the black hole is yes. uh, very close to the bound on chaos. Uh, that is uh, the Lyapunov exponent of. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, is it? Is that any? Uh... That's great. So that's going to be the next thing I'm going to talk about. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Good, good. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's, that's interesting. And uh, this question of a scrambling and bound and chaos. So, so I think that's, that, 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 that's an excellent point. Uh, uh, that's, that's the segue to my next topic. Uh, but before that, any other questions? OK, so if not there, so let me then talk about the chaos. And um, uh, so let's see. Right, so this is going to be Jeff Stock. Okay, sorry. Actually, so before that, I had one one more thing before talking about chaos. But so so uh, this this topic of Boltzmann reflectivity. Uh, in fact, you could get it without any assumption about quantum gravity. This you could just get it purely from uh, from uh, QED in curve space time. So this is a calculation we just did with um, with a, a former master's student, now PhD student, in Cornell. Uh, so. Uh, she, uh, she Van Den Cho and I, we basically looked at this question of what if you have a Hawking uh, plasma of electron positrons that are living outside the horizon as uh, Hawking uh, predicted, and then you have a photon that's infalling and it is interacting with this plasma. So what do you expect? And this is a purely, I mean, classic, uh, classical geometry calculation is quantum field theory in Kelvin space time. Um, and what we found, and again, we had we had two independent way of doing this calculation, and we, we got similar results. Um, I'm going to show you the result in a in a second. So we have two the two the two derivations. One is basically the fact that if you have a photon propagating in a plasma, it it acquires the mass, right? So what it does is this uh, is known as a plasma frequency. Um, but the higher the temperature, the, the higher is the number of electron positrons, so there will be a higher plasma frequency. So effectively, you get a potential barrier for the photon. Uh, we cannot calculate it exactly because it's, it's a bit complicated, so we can do it to like at the far away and the close to the horizon limit and then do some sort of interpolation, so we, we use different interpolations. Um, and the other method we use is just we use, use the one loop propagator for QED. Uh, in Minkowski, and then projected it into Rindler uh, space. Uh, so, and it turns out that they both give the same results, uh, which is, I'm oh, sorry, um, uh, they, they both give the same result, which is very similar to the Boltzmann reflectivity, but, of, but, but, but it, of course, it should be suppressed with alpha QED squared. So alpha is one over 137, um, because we're talking about electromagnetic interactions. So everything is suppressed by alpha. Um, you still have the same Boltzmann factor, but they have some some different frequency, uh, non-trivial frequency dependence. And all the calculations are kind of consistent with each other, different ways of doing it. And you can actually show this is not very surprising because QED is different from gravity. If you replace alpha QED with the alpha of gravity, which depends on energy, and imagine that it becomes a border one within the Planck length of the horizon, you recover the same Boltzmann reflectivity that we did before. Uh, but I mean, for the calculation that we actually did, we don't need any quantum gravity, it's all QED in Kerber space time calculation. And um, so, so what this does is it kind of reinforces this idea of Boltzmann reflectivity. Uh, as is for realistic uh, situations, situations where you don't have, say, conformal symmetry. Um, so that's anyway, so that's is, this is an interesting uh, side that even, um, even for QED, you may expect uh, significant reflectivity. Uh, although, I mean, it's not very significant because it's suppressed by alpha squared, but nevertheless, 
uh, it could become significant at low frequencies. Okay, so are there any questions about this? Okay, so so let's go to the question of chaos. So I think as uh, as uh, Massimo mentioned, there is this uh, very interesting result that uh, black holes uh, have uh, very interesting affinity with chaotic systems, and there are bounds on Lyapunov exponents uh, that you expect. Uh, and uh, so this is all, as far as I know, it started with a paper by Sakino and Saskin that uh, proposed black holes are the fastest scramblers, in fact, fastest the scramblers that you have in nature. And you have a time scale for a scrambling, which is a time scale uh, to mix all the information uh, or entangle every uh, everything with everything else. Um, and that time scale is given by, um, uh, in terms of the thermal time scale, which is a, meta, a beta would be the rate of uh, uh, the Lyapunov exponent uh, that was proposed. And the time scale for a scrambling is logarithmically larger uh, than that by log of n, when n is the dimension of the Hilbert space or something like that. Um, so that was uh, the proposal. And the interesting thing is that, in fact, a scrambling time is the same as echo time. It wasn't very, uh, it wasn't uh, obvious at first, but then we, we kind of went through the literature and went through all the definitions. Uh, so there were two communities of people. There were a community who worked on echoes and a community who worked on a scrambling. And it turns out they are always talking about the same thing. And at least as far as the time scales are concerned, they are exactly the same time scale. So we kind of went, went through various situations where scrambling time were calculated and echo time uh, uh, can be calculated and we showed that they're all the same. So, so that was kind of interesting. And what this means is not, uh, exactly clear um but we have some guesses uh so there's uh, the gravitational waves that cause an, a, a scrambling times that uh, so basically wherever you could do the calculation that happen to be the same um and we have a guess as to what this means it basically has to do with uh, when perturbation theory breaks down in um in uh, uh, in, in in perturbative calculations of out of time order correlators so basically all calculations that you have for out of time order correlators which are these indicators of chaos in, um, uh, that are usually used in, in holography. So the time scale at which the perturbation theory calculations or one over n expansions break down, and that time scale is a scrambling time. So what the echo uh, picture tells you is that when the perturbation theory breaks down, that's when you expect to see the first echo. And then that's, uh, so the echo picture tells you that is, is essentially an unperturbative completion of the, uh, or a resummation of the perturbative one over n expansion. So generically what you have indeed for these guys is that you have a one over n, um, um, so let's see, uh, for some reason my, um, my pen has stopped working. Hmm. Okay, so let's try this again. Okay, so my pen has a stop working. I'm not sure, so I guess I'm not going to write it down. But so there is there's a time scale at which the perturbation theory breaks down, and that time scale is uh, I don't know why that is. It has charged. Um, okay, so I guess yeah, the pen doesn't work for some reason. Um, Okay, so uh, in any event, and uh, so so these echoes are an unperturbative completion of um, uh, or the resummation of uh, the the one over n expansion that usually you use, uh, and in one over expansion, all you do is that it breaks down around the scrambling time, and the echoes picture suggests that basically beyond that you have these repeating patterns. Now that's a guess. We have to do actual calculations. And we have we have made some progress in that direction by um, doing uh, so. Uh, so we, this is a picture we kind of worked in. Is this the ra random matrix model from black holes? When we showed for some sort of generalization of random matrix model, you can get these these late time echoes depending on exactly how you how you construct these random matrices. So that's the kind of a holographic, or at least towards a holographic dual or holographic description of where echoes may be coming from. Okay, any questions? 
Okay, so let me uh, move on. Uh, we could also derive this from uh, Kara CFD, which is a different and uh, not quite as, as much established holographic description of black holes. But we kind of we, we took this construction by uh, Castro, Maloney, and Strominger, and basically showed what type of uh, identification in it, in fact, gives you echoes. And it seems kind of quite natural, and it gives you, in fact, the same Boltzmann reflectivity. So this is this this gives you the absorption cross section of the black holes, which is the the, the continuous the dashed line. And then you could either use a CFD picture uh, with the, these identification parameters or these modular parameters, or you could use Boltzmann echoes, and they give you basically the same result depending on your parameter. Okay, so these are kind of theoretical ideas that we're not specifying exactly the microstructures, but based on uh, holographic ideas or generic quantum mechanics ideas, we're trying to guess what you should guess, what you should get. But at the end of the day, uh, we want to fi find this in, da in data. And we had many years of um, uh, a speculation about quantum black holes, uh, the same way that we had for a standard model, for example. But at the end of the day, we want to see it in data. And I have this analogy, uh, and I'd be happy to hear uh, arguments against this, that uh, I have this analogy between echoes to LIGO being basically similar to eggs in LHC, uh, LHC as they were predicted um, um, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, so they're basically both on these three basic principles. Uh, unitarity, you want your theory of GR to be unitary, and you want your theory of a star model to be unitary. Uh, based on perturbative effective field theory, uh, at least outside the horizon for the black holes. And finally, it is based on a symmetry of the theory. So uh, on the right-hand side, you had gauge symmetries of a standard model. So if you insist on the gauge symmetry of a standard model, unitarity and perturbativity, then Higgs really uh, is, uh, is the simplest possibility that you have, uh, or something similar to that. On the left-hand side, the symmetry is, of course, different. It's not gauge symmetries of a standard model. It's, it's, it's a diffeomorphism symmetry, which is, uh, which, from which you could derive holographic entropy bond with some assumptions. Uh, and of course, this combination of these three says if something strange should happen at the horizon, and that would lead to echoes. So of course, the same way that Higgs didn't have to be there, echoes don't have to be there. But uh, the most conservative possibility is the fact that if, if seeing echoes. Uh, so that in a sense, that, that's the subjective statement. But I'm, I'm saying that the same sense that Higgs was the most um, conservative possibility. OK, so now do we see them in data? So we kind of started looking uh, for these uh, shortly after the LIGO data was released. Uh, now, I'm not going to go through the entire history because it's a very uh, kind of convoluted and confused history. Uh, it's not a very long history, but lots of people have been working and arguing on this. So the first work was uh, we kind of be looking in the uh, first set of LIGO data, and uh, we kind of there's a point where you predict echoes to be, which is at uh, basically where uh, the point three second I tell you comes from Planck scale outside the horizon, and we kind of we had we made up some template and looked for it, and it turns out the biggest peak in all the data from the O1 happened to be exactly where it was predicted. Uh, and the chance of that happening just by random chance is one in a hundred. So this, this, these black lines is from the three events that was released in first LIGO uh, observations or one data. So that was kind of interesting, uh, tantalizing. It's not five sigma, it's like two, two and a half sigma. Um, but it was interesting that, I mean, the, the biggest peak in the data, basically, if you look for something that happened after the merger, and happen in the same parametric time for all the events, it happens to be right, uh, right around the Planck, uh, Planckian echo time scale, this um, basically beta times log n that I mentioned early on. Um, okay, sorry. Okay, I... It's okay. Anyway, so... Then this was uh, with Jahid Abedi and Hannah Dykar, who, uh, so Jahid Abedi was visiting PhD students and Hannah was an undergraduate student. Um, and in fact, uh, you don't may not know ha Hannah, uh, she, but you may probably know her mother who won the Nobel Prize, uh, I think a couple of years after our paper. Uh, 
and uh, she's my colleague at uh, University of Waterloo. In any event, so let's see. Um, so interestingly, there are other, other papers that kind of found similar things. For example, this paper came out in 2019 for, by, by members of the LIGO collaboration. And they found in particular this, uh, these two, basically the same two events that we were looking at, uh, two out of the three. They find these post-merger signals at 0.2 and 0.1 second, which are happenly, uh, happen to be exactly 0.1 and 0.2 seconds that we were predicting from Planck and Echoes. Uh, so these, the, the numbers at the bottom came from uh, basically expectation from Planck and scale Echoes for the masses and the spins of these two events. And these numbers were actually measured uh, completely independently from, uh, from a different method. It's not so, so called coherent wave burst method. Uh, and this is basically what they saw. They saw basically these things. For example, this is for one of them. They saw this signal that happened to be right after uh, the event uh, within, I think this was this, uh, around 0.1 second after the main event. Uh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. It was 0.2 seconds. 0.2 seconds. Okay, 0.2 seconds. Sorry, thanks, Jared, for correcting me. So, I think Jared is in the audience. Um, okay, so this was the main event, and this was the echo. And in fact, the interesting thing is that you could independently look at the position of this guy and the position of this guy in the sky, and they happen to be basically located. Depend, it's, it does a little bit uh, depend on how you find these guys, but uh, they they happen to be basically more or less. Uh, uh, co-located, even though they are really independent of each other. So this gives you additional evidence that this is real because it happens to be at the same, more or less the same place in the sky as this guy. And based on this, you could get uh, basically co-localization base factor somewhere between two to five. So that was interesting. So the time scale matches and the position in the sky also matches at least for this event. And this is another event that, in fact, this is uh, Jahed is, hasn't published this, but it's uh, uh, this is based on his Bayesian uh, MCMC analysis, and it's here he is fitting for Boltzmann echoes, and this is the biggest black hole another event that LIGO has seen, 1905-21, uh, and you see these two uh, post-merger events that are happening here. Uh, they are also consistent with what you expect. Time scale for them is consistent with what you expect, given the mass and the spin of this uh, this object. So that's, uh, that's another independent evidence. And uh, this is also considered substantial evidence. The base factor for this is around four. Um, so this is uh, another work in progress. We're kind of stacking all the events. Uh, this is with, um, uh, this is with uh, Luis Lango and uh, Cecilia Charenti is this in progress. So if you're stacking all the LIGO events, there are four, 39 events here. So this is the main events. And if you are already scaling them with the right uh, with the, the black hole temperature, so there's some evidence for uh, for echoes here, although it's not very decisive when you combine everything. Again, I'm going through different uh, dif uh, reviewing different work. So this is a, a, another group, uh, Bob Holdem at University of Toronto. He has a different way of way of looking uh, finding echoes, which uh, I don't quite uh, agree with, but nevertheless, he's he's finding uh, all of these events. And uh, he's claiming that basically they're all consistent with each other, at least for the events that he looked at. And you can see the p-values in this paper uh, that he published last year. They range between 1% to 0.1%. So they seem pretty significant if you, if you believe the numbers. So, so far, there are basically these are three independent groups that you, you could see uh, that, that, that have found this for, for, for these different events. However, it's important to know that not everyone finds echoes. Uh, so this is uh, from uh, LIGO's last paper on test of general relativity that came out in uh, October to, uh, 2020. And um, so you see that based on the waveform that they looked at, which is uh, a very simplistic template, um, uh, they don't find significant evidence for most of these uh, with, with some exceptions. So they are negative uh, means that there's no, no evidence. Now I should say that uh, this is not uh, this is not really the model that we use or other people have used, but nevertheless, uh, their search did, didn't uh, result in any significant detection, at least for most events. So, uh, so that's kind of the status, and uh, we have a review paper which is about a year old now, 
Uh, we kind of summarize the status and we have two workshops that you could find online where there have been lots of discussions back and forth between various groups uh, who claim that there's something there or maybe nothing there. Um, here is a, uh, this is a compilation of different groups. So on the left there, where there is positive evidence, view value less than 5%. On the right, there are searches that uh, looked for it and then they didn't find anything. So the, the reality is that the situation is very confused. And if you try to get deep into any of these, there is lots of minutia about what is the right way of doing a statistical analysis and is 2% large or a small, the p-value of 2%. Is none of these are at the level of 10 to the minus five, a p-value of 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus six, which is a level of detection in particle physics. Um, none of them are quite there yet. So at that level, I think everybody agrees that the signal, we need better signal, better signal to know is to actually claim detection. But one of really confusing factors is that we don't exactly know what we're looking for. So different people are looking for different things. And then some may find something and some may not find it. But since they are looking for different things, they're not really inherently con in contradictory with each other. Uh, so that's kind of this, the status of this. And um, okay, so I guess I have 10 minutes. Is that right? Basically, we yeah, yeah so around 10 have, minutes left. But, but that includes questions. So, so probably okay. should finish up pretty soon, then you know, leave okay. some, a little bit of time for questions. Sure, I, I will do that. Um, so I, uh, so this is this is kind of a status right now, which is very confused. But uh, what's going to happen in the future is that we're going to have much better data. And I, uh, I have a few slides, or had a few slides, to show you about what a program I call quantum black hole seismology, where we could use uh, systematically the observational data to to probe the inner structure of quantum black holes or fuzzballs, if you will. Uh, so this is basically with analogy with what you do, say, with Earth or with other stars. We, we, we study all the modes uh, of internal oscillations. And based on that, you could, you could uh, basically read out the internal structure of Earth. So this is how we know the Earth has a core and has a mantle, all these various structures. So we could do the same thing with uh, quantum black holes. And it's different from a spectroscopy that you've kind of heard about. Um, so that's why I want to use this term seismology, which is as opposed to the spectroscopy, which is more traditionally talk about the light ring of the black holes. So, uh, so I'm not going to go through any of the details, but basically it all has to do with uh, these various harmonics that you can get. And the structure of these harmonics, their position, and then their heights depends on the reflectivity laws that you use and uh, various assumptions that you make. So, uh, so we kind of have systematically gone through various assumptions you could make and see is uh, looked at how these these resonances or these harmonics of the quantum black hole would look different. So uh, you could also get some interesting uh, structures depending on your modified dispersion relationship. Here's like a fractal the structure of harmonics uh, near the horizon frequency. It turns out. For, for one of the possible uh, models of quantum black holes where you have modified dispersion relationship. So you may get, uh, so basically in some cases you have uh, equally spaced harmonics. In some case you have a like, fractal structure for harmonics. And, uh, and then there are different examples. Um, so in fact, we have one detection or potential detection of uh, these harmonics due to Jahed, who's I guess on the call as well. Uh, and we kind of used uh, use the Boltzmann echo model and see whether we can actually fit it. And it's, it turns out that most case, most possibilities we don't cannot fit it, but there is a one possible uh, initial excitation and model that can fit it. So it's 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 actually not easy to fit these uh, these uh, these observations, even if they are real, because you have to satisfy a lot of uh, a lot of constraints, and uh, that's kind of what we did in one of our papers. And so that it's possible, but it's actually very marginal or close. Uh, so let me skip this. We also have a Bayesian way of doing this uh, with, with another student, Petrodov. So that should come up soon. And there's still positive evidence. At least this is for one of the events for the binary neutral star merger that probably forms a black hole. So uh, let me wrap up. Uh, so the conclusion is that much of the fairy tales about what lies within black holes has no empirical evidence. Uh, 
so logarithmically delayed echoes are physical probes of quantum black hole microstructure and these are ones that are uh, that are very concrete they are testable now and i think my, my best bet in finding uh, what the microstructures are is by understanding and probing these uh, these echoes there is tantalizing though controversial hints for echoes so which events uh, should have them? We don't really know which templates we should use. So that's really where the crux of the controversy is. Uh, so Black Hole Seismology is a, a systematic program to probe this quantum structure. Even if it's not there, uh, seismology would be the way to find out that it's not there. And here's, I guess, my last line. Don't ask what echoes can do for you. Ask what you can do for echoes. There you go. OK, uh, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And so I think there are uh, there is st uh, still time for questions. Five minutes or any questions? Can I ask something about the echoes from in the start? Um, so is it? Am I right to say that um, when you're talking about echoes as stimulated emission, do you? This is completely a separate. This is a completely separate mechanism than. What you typically do is, I mean, you typically have some some metric, and then you throw in some wave, for example, a probe mm -hmm. scalar wave, and then you see what what bounces back, right? And those are your echoes. Yeah. So this is a completely different mechanism that you're no. proposing, or no? No, I I, I think um, so. What you are discussing is a classical description, right? Yes. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that the quantum mechanical description of that is a stimulated emission. So I'm not saying as a different method. I'm saying it's just a, a quantum. Uh, what you describe in a quantum language is 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 this basically. Okay. And so, but you, I mean, so so doing either the perturbing it with a classical scalar wave or your quantum analysis should give the same answer. That basically is what you're saying, uh, right? Well, the problem with the classical analysis is, um, I mean, depends on how you modify things. Uh, so you, you don't actually know what you get because, I mean, depends on your potential barrier. So, so there's an ambiguity in the classical analysis, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so this quantum analysis uh, gives you a number. So it gives you this Boltzmann reflectivity, but it has its own limitations. It, it, it assumes perturbativity. Um, so, so it's 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 essentially used. It's like an Einstein A and B coefficient, which used like Fermi's Fermi's golden rule, mm -hmm. which is only valid to second order perturbation theory. So, so they both have their own problems, but I think they are really the same, uh, describing the same thing, um, uh, but in different languages. I mean, one is okay. purely classical, the other is uh, purely quantum. Okay. So then, so then, let me ask ask my 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 worry question. Let's say, mm -hmm. which is for the for classical echoes, what you know, worries me in quotation marks is that, you know, as your microstructure, whatever it is at the horizon gets more and more complicated, there's mm -hmm. not just one time scale where the, the wave goes in, reflects and comes back out. It's gonna be very, very complicated, the interactions. And so yes. what's coming out is not gonna be this very sharp peak. It's gonna be very chaotic uh, stuff that you don't really, and you, yes. and you at some point, if the, if the structure is so chaotic, you're not gonna be able to distinguish it from the background, let's say. And so with yeah. your with your quantum approach, do you do you have a similar kind of pitfall or is there, you know, maybe right. the, the fact that, that you're saying it's a perturbative approach, uh, once you do a lot of uh, bouncing around of the wave within right. the microstructure, this is where it breaks down or something like that or? or, that, that, or that's an excellent point. So, so uh, I think that is exactly captured by this uh, Boltzmann damping that uh, at high frequencies, you have uh, exponential suppression uh, and I think that's that exactly random bouncing around that you're talking about. Yeah. That that I mean, for individual microstructures. Sorry, my son keeps asking for chocolate cookies, so I'm a little bit distracted. But yeah, so um, so um, so so yeah, for individual microstructures, you have you, you have this randomness. But now imagine you do a thermal averaging, right? So you average over all the thermal uh, microstates, right? And then uh, basically the claim is that this Boltzmann is what comes out of that. Averaging. And at high frequencies, you get a small effect, you get a small number because of this thermal av uh, average over microstate. And the small frequencies, uh, and that's where you cannot actually do this, uh, the geometric, yeah. 
Okay. So at the small frequencies, that geometric averaging in fact breaks down because it's not a it's not a geometric optics uh, approximation. Right. Uh, and then you don't get cancellation. So that's that's kind of the lesson from this calculation is that the geometric picture is in fact a very good picture, but it's only good for high frequencies, and then you get these large cancellations. At the small frequencies, you have a fully wave wave description, and then for that wave description, you should um, you don't get cancellations. You get this Boltzmann reflectivity basically. Okay, Nick, you have a question. I think so Stan was before me. I had a question, but I think- Oh, it's sorry. Hard. Okay, I, I've ahead, seen your, sorry. okay, yeah. Stan, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my, my question is whether what you call a uh, quantum black hole microstructure uh, refers to uh, the stretched horizon rather than the event horizon, because when I'm a bit troubled when I think about an event horizon for a quantum black hole, since in a quantum black hole, the singularity is supposed to be resolved. So I was just wondering whether wh what you mean is the stretch horizon, which is a place rather than. Yeah, know, yeah, no, no, I think, I think it should be a stretch. I and mean, certainly somewhere outside the event horizon, uh, the classical uh, general relativistic description should break down. Uh, so yeah, I think a stretch horizon is a good terminology for it. Uh, I mean, how far exactly. outside it would be, uh, I mean, of course, model dependent. So, so, so it's a space-like surface, not a light-like surface. It's a time-like surface. The stretch horizon is a time-like surface. Yeah, so it's, but, 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 it's not, but it's not a light-like surface, which is- it, yeah, it's that, absolutely. It's not a light-like surface. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Okay, there is uh, Francisco and Nick. I don't know who was first, but maybe Nick Francisco start. First. No, Nick. No, no, no. Go. No, go for it. I'm still trying to formulate my question. Okay, <laughs> then Francisco, please. Okay, I have a similar question to the one of Daniel. Uh, okay. To that. Uh, um, the echo time scale, how mm -hmm. different is from the photon ring uh, size? Uh, so th there is this logarithmic factor which makes it longer. If that's uh, is that what you're asking? So yeah, my question is, if it's related to the photon ring the, the scale. Yeah, the photon ring scale, of course, is a, is a is a is a length of scale, if you want. So I guess it's like three m or or so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the 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 echo times are logarithmically longer than that. So. It's that like basically roughly eight eight m times log of m for a Schwarzschild black hole, mm -hmm. and so that so echo times are always a stretch because of this logarithmic factor that I told you. And for for astrophysical black holes, that logarithmic factor is about a hundred. But then I can I can compute this classically because this is essentially the time that take light to, to go inside the 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 micro the, the fast one, let's say the the, geometry, the compact object and come back absolutely yeah yeah mm -hmm. okay okay uh nika is it your yeah, time now or? Uh, just quickly uh, maybe it's an easy question but uh, what I'm bothered by is the Boltzmann reflection seems to involve things that are intrinsically extremely low energy quanta. And, yeah. in order to get a, and yet you're looking for the data of a reflection in a LIGO output, which involves incredibly high energy, high energy events. So do I really expect that a Boltzmann reflection to actually show up in LIGO data? It seems like you're operating at completely the wrong end of the energy spectrum. Right, that, that's an excellent question, and I think that's an excellent point, which, um, um, in fact, is, is a point that Samir, uh, Samir makes, is that the, the only, you only need to solve the information paradox for Hawking photons uh, or Hawking quanta, which are very, extremely low energy. Now, that is why this analogy with the stimulated emission is important, uh, or it could, could, be, could be useful, it doesn't mean it's correct. Uh, Indeed, it is true that you you do you do only need uh, to change things for Hawking quanta to solve the information paradox, but that doesn't mean that things only change for low energies because I mean there is an energy and there is a frequency and those are two different things, especially if you have a lot of particles. Um, so you could have these coherent states of low frequency quanta, 
uh, where frequency is low, but energy is high because you have, a, you have many, many particles per state. Uh, and those are really gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are made out of many, many gravitons, but at a very low frequency comparable to Hawking temperature. Uh, and we know the example of that in uh, when we deal with atoms, that's how you get a stimulated emission, right? So, so that's why I'm saying that uh, in that case, uh, that's where this comes from. So uh, the reason that, and I think these various calculations that we've done, some classical, some more quantum mechanical, they suggest that it's not the energy that matters, it's the frequency that matters. And if you have many particles at low frequencies, you still expect non-trivial things happening. What I guess I'm asking is to reflect such a thing uh, in LIGO, you can, it looks, it suggests to me you need a macroscopic structure of the horizon, which is untenable in general relativity theory. But you know, that's my concern. Well, I mean, uh, I don't think it's macroscopic. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very close to the horizon. And I mean, everything is very close to the horizon. Then when, by the time it gets out, it's red shifted and becomes the frequency. You see the frequency that LIGO sees is the same as Hawking temperature. So in terms of frequency, we are at the right place with LIGO. Is that the, at, in terms of energy, which we are very off because energy is much bigger than Planck, but frequency is just the right, the right number. And then the question is, which one is the one that's more important? And basically all these arguments that I have says that it's the frequency that's more important, not the energy. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, okay. If not, I think we can uh, thank uh, Niash again.